the First Vatican Council convened and reaffirmed the most important dogmatic decree on creation in the history of the Catholic Church, the Firmater, which defined that God, solely by his own omnipotent power, created all the different kinds of corporeal creatures and spiritual creatures for man from the beginning of time at once, which was understood by all the greatest commentators on this council to mean that God created everything by fiat in the beginning, either in the six days, which was the overwhelming majority view among the fathers of the church and the doctors, or instantaneously, which was the minority view of St. Augustine. The fathers of Vatican I were very aware that Enlightenment philosophy had begun to infect the thinking of many Catholic intellectuals. And it was Descartes and Immanuel Kant, Spinoza and the Enlightenment philosophers who first began to popularize the notion that it was reasonable to explain the origins of everything in the universe in terms of the same material processes that are going on now. And even though Descartes' works were put on the index by the church authorities in the 17th century, by the 19th century, and especially by the end of the 19th century, this false Enlightenment philosophy had begun to be accepted by many intellectuals in what was once Christendom. And so the Fathers of Vatican I handed down a very important anathema and it's heartbreaking that today so few Catholics even know that this anathema exists, but it's still on the books. And this anathema says that if anyone says that to the dogmas of the faith, a meaning must be sometimes assigned according to the progress of science, different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. The reason why this anathema is so important is because what it defines once and for all is that there is nothing that we will ever learn in astronomy, in geology, in biology, in any branch of natural science that is true, that will ever contradict the doctrine of creation as it was understood at the moment when that anathema was handed down. So you may say, well, Mr. Owen, how do we know how the dogma of creation was understood at that moment? Very easily. Because at the moment that this anathema was handed down, the Pope mandated the Catechism of the Council of Trent as the gold standard for teaching and preaching in the whole world. So the way that the dogma of creation was understood at that moment is exactly the way that it's defined in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catechism. And this is how it's defined, as we saw last night. If you look up the explanation of the first article of the Creed, this is how the dogma of creation is defined for pastors so that they can teach this dogma to their illiterate people very clearly. The divinity created all things in the beginning, not just hydrogen, helium, and lithium, at the moment of the alleged Big Bang. All things, he spoke and they were made, he commanded and they were created. And if you read this beautiful explanation of the dogma of creation in the Roman Catechism, it goes on to say, this is how God created all the different kinds of plants, this is how he created all the different kinds of heavenly bodies, this is how he creates the different kinds of animals, and this is how he creates Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side, and then he stops creating new kinds of creatures because he created everything for us, not for the angels, but for us, and he created for us a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe that was completely free, not only from human death, but from deformity, disease, man-harming natural disasters, or any of these kinds of disorders. And it was only the original sin that brought these disorders into the universe. Now it's obvious 
that this is how the teaching authority of the church understood the dogma of creation at the moment this anathema was handed down. Here we have Pope Leo XIII, 10 years after Vatican I is broken up by the Masonic forces in Italy under Garibaldi, writing an encyclical to the bishops of the whole world, telling them they must defend holy marriage against the Freemasons and their allies who want to introduce legal divorce into Catholic countries like Italy where it's prohibited by law. And he tells the bishops of the whole world, you must defend holy marriage on this foundation. And then he says, we record what is known to all and cannot be denied by anyone that God on the sixth day of creation, having formed man from the slime of the earth and having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave him a companion whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam when he was locked in sleep. So the Vicar of Christ says, you can only defend holy marriage on this foundation, that God created one man, body and soul, for one woman whom he formed from the body of the first man, one man for one woman for life from the beginning of creation. But look what happens. Just two years after Pope Leo XIII sends this beautiful encyclical on holy marriage all over the world, Father Vigarou, one of the leading Catholic scripture scholars in the world, goes into print saying, no, creation wasn't all by fiat at the beginning because geology has proven that creation was spread out over huge eons of time. And he goes so far as to say it was reserved to our time to finally figure out how to correctly interpret the meaning of day in Genesis 1, which is fairly astonishing because basically he's saying the fathers, the doctors, the popes, the council fathers who went before us, when it comes to this, they were all simpletons. But thanks to Charles Lyell and James Hutton, we finally figured it out. Well, it's an absolute miracle that after Pope Leo XIII founded the Pontifical Biblical Commission to combat modernism in scriptural exegesis, and Pope St. Pius X in 1907 made the PBC, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, an arm of the magisterium saying, if you don't accept its decrees, you are guilty of serious sin. It's a miracle that Father Vigarou was made the secretary of the PBC and yet his erroneous ideas were not permitted by Almighty God to enter into any of the official decrees of the PBC. That's a miracle on the order of the 1994 catechism not even mentioning the word evolution. <laughs> God protects his church. But the PBC did give some very important responses to questions pertaining to the correct interpretation of the first chapters of Genesis. And some of the most important responses were made in 1909. Unfortunately, if our children and grandchildren are told anything about the PBC decrees during this period, and usually they are not, the only thing that is usually mentioned to them is that in 1909, the PBC said that Catholic theologians could discuss whether Yom or Dies day in Genesis 1 meant a 24-hour day or an indefinite space of time. But that is very misleading because if you read that response in the context of all of the responses, you will see that the PBC teaches that all of Genesis is true history. There is no admixture of myth or fiction whatsoever and the burden of proof is 100% on anyone who challenges the literal and obvious sense of anything in the first 11 chapters, in this case, the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. Moreover, in one of the responses, 
the PBC, as an arm of the magisterium, reminds us that there are three facts that pertain to the foundations of the Christian religion, which we find in the first three chapters of Genesis, which no Catholic can ever deny. Number one, the creation by God of all things at the beginning of time. That's the teaching of the Roman Catechism. Not that God created a few things which turned into everything else through natural processes, no. That God created all things in the beginning. Secondly, that God created Adam body and soul as a special creation. And number three, that God literally created Eve from Adam's body. Tragically, if our young people are taught anything about this, except in an exceptional school like this one, they will usually be taught that we don't uphold this any longer. We've moved beyond this. This teaching is no longer upheld in the church. But if a student asks, as a priest friend of mine did when he was in seminary, after a professor has said that these decrees of the PBC are no longer binding, we've, the, the magisterium has set them aside, my priest friend as a seminarian asked, excuse me, sir, but could you please show us when the magisterium of the Catholic Church abrogated or superseded these decrees at the same or a higher level of authority, silence. Because they never have been abrogated, they never have been superseded at this level of authority or at a higher level of authority. They're still on the books. St. Pius X was a prophet, and he realized that in the church, within the membership of the church, not tainting the Immaculate Bride of Christ, but within the membership of the church, had entered the worst heresy in the history of Christianity, modernism. And in 1907, he devotes his most important encyclical, Pascendi, to this topic. And in that encyclical, he says that evolution is the principal doctrine of the modernists. Now, we're all very well aware that we're dealing with the fruits of modernism. But how many of us are conscious of the fact that evolution is the principal doctrine of our worst enemy? And how are we ever going to eradicate an evil if we don't identify what is at the root of that evil? We're never going to do it. Now, why is modernism the worst heresy ever, and why is evolution its principal doctrine? This is very important to understand. All other heresies in the history of the church added something, subtracted something, twisted something, but left most of the faith intact. Even the Protestant Revolution. But with modernism, it's different because modernism, as the Pope says here, is based on the idea that everything is evolving. Everything is in flux. There are no stable natures. And therefore, the Pope said, if these people get control, they are going to destroy everything because they're going to say the liturgy that was good for our forefathers it's not appropriate any longer because we've evolved into a new situation. The marriage law that was good a hundred years ago, it's not adequate any longer. We've evolved into a new situation. He saw they will destroy everything because modernism is based on evolution. But at the same time, that Pope St. Pius X was warning us about what was going to happen if we did not correct this evil, here in the United States, many of our own leading Catholic intellectuals were going full tilt to integrate 
microbe to man evolution, the idea that something like a microbe turned into a human body capable of receiving a human soul through the same kinds of natural processes that are going on now. And Father John Augustine Zahm at Notre Dame University was one of the leaders in this movement. Father Zahm was a theologian, but he was also a natural scientist. And he wanted to put Notre Dame at the forefront, the cutting edge of Catholic academia by emphasizing natural science and embracing evolution. So he began writing books showing how the Catholic faith could be reconciled with the, the fact of microbe to man evolution. And one of his strongest proofs, if not his strongest proof, that something like a microbe turned into a human body through a natural process of evolution was, and we'll look at it in a moment, the drawings of the German anatomist Ernst Haeckel, who purported to show that the human embryo was identical to the embryo of the fish, the pig, the turtle, the chicken, and the salamander at the same stage of development, thus proving that humans in their mother's womb go through all the stages of evolution. We go through a fish stage when we have gills, an amphibian stage, a reptile stage when we have a tail, and then finally, at some point, we reach that fully human stage of evolution in the mother's womb. And not many Catholics realize that we can draw a direct line from that terrible day at the beginning of the 20th century when Father Zahm and Notre Dame embraced theistic evolution and that even more terrible day a hundred years later when Barack Obama, the most pro-abortion political leader in the entire world, walked on stage at Notre Dame University and received an honorary degree while the real Catholics were being handcuffed and taken down to the local armory, not even allowed to protest this abomination. Because you see, without the denigration of the sacred humanity of the unborn child from the moment of conception, which theistic evolution always accomplishes, there would never have been an honorary degree for Barack Obama at the beginning of the 21st century. And here's Father Zahm's proof. The faked drawings of Ernst Teckel, who drew a human embryo, copied it, and then claimed that those copies were the embryos of the chicken, the pig, the turtle, the fish, and the salamander at the same stage of development. Now, our Blessed Mother, the Queen of Prophets, was not going to leave us without fair warning. So she intervenes with the greatest public miracle since the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on October 13, 1917, the miracle of the Son. And this great miracle is to confirm that her message to the three children at Fatima is urgent and true. And in that message she says, if my requests are not heeded, Russia, which the little children probably couldn't have found on a map, will spread her errors throughout the world. And of course, only weeks after the miracle of the sun, the Bolshevik revolution took place in Russia. Now, if we were to ask those few Catholics today in the United States who even know about Fatima, what was the principal error that took hold in Russia with the Bolshevik revolution? Most of them will say communism. But that is false. If you study the lives of the principal leaders of the communist revolution in Russia, you will find that it was evolution that destroyed their faith in Christianity, destroyed their faith in God, made them confident atheists, confident materialists, and therefore confident communists. On his desk, Lenin had this sculpture, a chimpanzee, sitting on a pile of books, one of which is Darwin's Origin of Species, contemplating a human skull. And as Lenin sat at this desk, he authorized the murder of millions of his own fellow countrymen because they stood in the way of evolutionary progress. Stalin took over after Lenin. Stalin was educated in a monastic seminary 
but he read the works of Lyle and Darwin, completely lost his faith, and began going around to the other seminarians saying, you have to read these books. The Bible's a pack of lies. We're descended from apes. There's no God. And Stalin was responsible for the murder of some 20 million human beings because they too stood in the way of evolutionary progress to the communist utopia. Our Lady said that Russia would spread her errors, and Russia was the principal sponsor, the Russian communists were the principal sponsors of Chinese communism. Here we see Bishop Cuthbert O'Gara, a passionist missionary bishop in China, watches as the Chinese communists come into his diocese, and he sees the first thing that they do in every town is to force all the adults into a hall like this for a seminar. He wonders, what is this seminar going to be? Is it going to be Marx? Is it going to be Lenin? Is it going to be Mao Zedong? No, it was always the same. Evolution. You are a product of a material process of evolution. You have no soul. There is no God. There is no afterlife. Everything is just the result of a material process of evolution because the communists saw that if they could get the people to believe this, then they could easily get them to believe in the rest of their communist mumbo-jumbo. Our Lady said the errors would spread. Many people think that the first genocide of the 20th century was the Armenian genocide. That is false. The first genocide of the 20th century was the African genocide because in the scramble for colonies in Africa, the Germans carved out a huge area of Africa, including parts of Tanzania, Cameroon, huge areas. And these German military and colonial civil governors were diehard evolutionists. And they believed that Africans were at a lower stage of evolution, missing links between apes and humans, if you will. They literally called them baboons. And there were entire tribes in this part of Africa that were practically wiped off the face of the earth because these German military leaders believed that these people were subhuman and they could be exterminated if they did not do exactly what they were told. And of course, these same German intellectuals became the enthusiastic supporters of Hitler and his Nazi eugenics program. Hitler believed that the Nazi party would help to bring evolution to the next stage. And he was supported by the overwhelming majority of the German intellectual elite. Dr. Mengele at Auschwitz was typical of German intellectuals who supported the Nazi eugenics program. He performed barbaric experiments on living human subjects in Auschwitz, but he thought he was being a good scientist because he reasoned that if he took a less evolved human like a gypsy or someone from Poland, stripped them naked, put them in freezing cold water, and watched how long it took them to die, he could use that vas valuable scientific data to help his more highly evolved Aryan Luftwaffe pilot so that if he got shot down over the North Sea, they could help him to survive. That wasn't wrong. He was just doing evolution in the lab. Margaret Sanger was another who jumped on the evolutionary bandwagon. And for her, birth control became the sort of sacrament of her evolutionary religion because she realized with birth control, governments will be able to prohibit the less fit, the less evolved people from reproducing themselves and only allow the more fit, the more evolved people, like herself, of course, to reproduce. And then we will be able to get rid of the dead weight of human waste. Now, in 1959, the mainstream scientific community celebrated the 100th anniversary of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. And at that time, the most prominent natural scientist champion of microbe-to-man evolution was this man, Sir Julian Huxley. 
And Sir Julian looked back after a hundred years in which the evolutionists had controlled almost all of the universities, almost all the research centers, and most of the funding for scientific research, and he laid it on the line. The best proof that something like a microbe turned into a human body over millions of years of the same kinds of material processes that are going on now. And he said that proof was embryology. Well, it's interesting that just nine years before, Pope Pius XII had published the last authoritative magisterial docu document on evolution, the encyclical Humani Generis in 1950. Now, young people today are told that very commonly, that with Humani Generis, the Pope allowed Catholics to believe and teach evolution. That is completely false. If you read the encyclical, you'll see the Pope says the bishops must teach that all of Genesis 1 to 11 is true history, that every word in the Bible is true, whether it speaks about faith and morals or history, geography, natural science, or anything else. The only permission that he gives is for Catholic experts to examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. The problem is the Pope was not obeyed. In the last 69 years, there hasn't been any open, honest debate between the defenders of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation and the innovators with their theistic evolution mythology. When that debate takes place, evolution is finished because it cannot survive open, honest debate and thorough investigation. But because the Pope wasn't obeyed, most of the bishops and leading Catholic intellectuals in the Western world accepted that Sir Julian Huxley knew what he was talking about without any critical examination. We have Cardinal Suenens at Vatican II trying to persuade his brother bishops to change the church's teaching on birth control. Why? Because he understood very well that the church had taken the position that contraception was a grave violation of the natural law, which is based on the premise that there's a human nature which was created by God, which is stable, which can't change. But evolution liberates us from that straitjacket and allows us, as Cardinal Suenen says, to understand what is according to nature in a different way. And then we have Father Rahner. Father Rahner is arguably the most influential Catholic theologian in Europe in the 20th century. Yet in 1970, he goes into print saying, yes, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The human baby goes through all the stages of evolution in the mother's womb. She goes through a fish stage, an amphibian stage, a reptile stage, and only finally, eventually, at some point, reaches that fully human stage of development. So now, the people who are waiting in the wings to legalize abortion, at least in the first trimester, and abortifacient contraception, now they can say, look, even your smartest intellectuals recognize that evolution is a fact. How can you Catholics be so stupid, so backward, as to think that something that's only in the fish stage of development deserves all the rights and privileges of a fully developed human being? But here's the thing. On the top row of this slide, we have Sir Julian Huxley's most striking proof that a microbe turned into a human body through a natural process of evolution. On the bottom row, we have the actual photographs of the human embryo and the embryos of the other kinds of creatures at the same stage of development. Now, I think we can all agree that evolutionary fantasy has nothing to do with reality. Not only 
is the human embryo distinct from all the other kinds of creatures, it's easy to see that each kind of creature has its own distinct pattern of embryonic development. This is completely contradictory to all the predictions of the leading evolutionists from Darwin to T.H. Huxley to Julian Huxley to Carl Sagan to Richard Dawkins down to the rest of them today. But it agrees perfectly with the sacred history of Genesis, where Moses tells us 10 times that God created each kind of creature to reproduce after its kind. So of course, we would expect that each of these different kinds of creatures has its own specific pattern of embryonic development, and that's exactly what we see. And these photographs were published in Scientific American in the 1990s. But that didn't stop evolutionary mythology from remaining in our children's biology textbooks. And you can find them in Catholic schools and universities all over the world. This is a 21st century biology textbook co-authored by a prominent member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And I can hardly see any difference between his drawings and the forgeries of Ernst Haeckel from the 19th century. And look at the caption. It's embarrassing to read this. A prominent member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences tells our children and grandchildren that all vertebrates start out with an enlarged head region, gill slits, and a tail. This is complete rubbish. What are called gill slits have nothing to do with respiration. They develop into the pharyngeal arches in different parts of our facial anatomy. What's called a tail has nothing to do with being a vestigial tail. But what happens to our children and grandchildren when they read these lies in their Catholic schools, in their biology classes? They are being conditioned to believe that Genesis is a myth, that evolution is a scientific fact, and that the human being is not fully human from the moment of conception. And this is why we have what can only be called the contraceptive holocaust. The worst holocaust of innocent life in the history of mankind. Because we know that while there are 40 to 50 million surgical abortions every year, there are at least five times as many little children who are murdered in their mother's wombs by different forms of contraception that do not prevent conception but prevent the conceived child from being able to survive and thrive in the mother's womb. So our Heavenly Father has to look down on this world that he made for us and see at least one quarter of a billion innocent human beings snuffed out in their mother's womb and from his church he hears almost not a sound. Because we have all been desensitized by this evolutionary pseudoscience. And it gets worse. Kinsey was raised in a devout Protestant home, went to university, became convinced of microbe to man evolution, became an atheist, went to Harvard, got a PhD, and founded a new science the science of perversion. It was based on this, that back in the Middle Ages, we had this quaint idea that God created a man and God created a woman. They had a human nature that was stable and there were certain kinds of behavior that were in accordance with that nature, which were good and normal and natural. And there were other kinds of behavior that were not in accordance with that nature and those were unnatural, abnormal and perverse. Well, Kinsey said, evolution's liberated us from that because now we look at our cousins, the bonobos, the chimpanzees. We see they do all this behavior that back in the Middle Ages we used to think was unnatural and abnormal, but now we know that it's actually natural and normal and good. <laughs> 
And with this evolutionary pseudoscience, he went to the Rockefeller Foundation and got a generous grant of money to begin studying in the new science of perversion, in which he studied people who were afflicted with various kinds of perversions and then made it seem that this abnormal behavior was much more common in the general population than it actually was, and then got the criminal code changed and the medical code and the psychiatric code and got us into the great big mess that we find ourselves in today. But how many people realize that the whole diabolical project was 100% based on evolutionary pseudoscience? But it gets worse. Father Kosnick was the rector of a Catholic seminary here in the United States at the height of the clergy abuse that's been coming to light over the last few decades. And yet, in an article published by the Journal of the Catholic Theological Society of America, he reached this astonishing conclusion that the behavioral sciences have not identified any sexual expression that can be shown to be in a value-free way detrimental to a full human existence. And we wonder why we have the problems that we have. Temptations to impurity are nothing new. The devil and his minions have always attacked, especially priests and consecrated religious in this area. What is new is that we have the people in charge of forming the future priests and bishops and religious of the church, giving them a scientific excuse for giving in to those temptations. This never happened before. Bishop McHugh was in charge of family life matters for the entire United States Bishops Conference, and yet he worked hand in hand with Planned Parenthood educators to design mandatory sex education programs to be forced upon all of the children in Catholic schools throughout the United States. How is this possible? Once again, you have to look at the evolutionary indoctrination that Bishop McHugh had already been subjected to. Here's something that he wrote. It's a little bit of gobbledygook. I'm going to translate into, into plain English, but I'm not distorting what he says. He says, we know that at this stage of evolution, the union between man and woman is the normal way that children come into the world. But he says... We cannot rule out that there won't be wonderful evolutionary breakthroughs in the future that will allow children to come into the world some other way. So you see, Bishop McHugh was most likely, almost certainly, before Vatican II taught, Genesis is a myth. Evolution is a fact. Science has enlightened us. So now we can understand how human beings evolved. So for him, what Pope Leo XIII said was the only foundation on which we can defend holy marriage and the social order, it's a fairy tale. And so in his mind, he separated two things that God had joined together by the very way that he created Adam and Eve in the beginning. That is the unitive and the procreative dimension of the marital union. But what did our Lord Jesus Christ say? He said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, not even a bishop of the Catholic Church. And here's where it all leads to. Cardinal Baldessari was made the moderator of the Synod on Marriage and the Family held in Rome recently. And when he was asked by members of the press, Your Eminence, how can you be spending so much time talking about how you can find a way to give Holy Communion to people who are living in what the church has always considered to be 
and objective state of mortal sin. This was his answer. He said, there's no reason to be scandalized. If you hear theologians talking about something against the so-called common doctrine. And then he goes on to say this. Dogma has its own evolution. That is a development, not a change. So you see, if a reptile can turn into a bird, if a land mammal can turn into a whale, if a common ancestor of chimps and humans can turn into a human body, then the teaching that behavior X cried out to heaven for punishment can turn into the teaching that it's not so bad. It could be acceptable. It has its positive elements. And look at this. Cardinal Pell was held up as one of the defenders of the traditional understanding of holy matrimony. And yet, in a televised debate with Richard Dawkins in Australia, Cardinal Pell said this, the account of Adam and Eve is a very sophisticated mythology. It's not a scientific truth. I don't want to know how many young Catholics lost their faith after watching this debate. But Richard Dawkins had a field day with that. He said, so Adam and Eve were only symbolic. So you say that your Lord Jesus Christ died in vicarious atonement for a non-existent sin committed by a non-existent individual. And we wonder why our children and grandchildren are leaving the church in droves. Well, Miss Acker is going to come up here now and explain to you that contrary to what Cardinal Pell told the audience in that televised debate, everything that we know in every area of natural science 100% harmonizes and confirms the sacred history of Genesis and the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation that was handed down to us from the apostles. So she's going to come now and speak to you about cutting edge genetics and what and how beautifully it reinforces everything that the church has always believed and taught about our first parents. But it's sobering to think that at the miracle of the sun at Fatima, what the witnesses experienced was something very much like what the people of Sodom and Gomorrah experienced when they were chastised by God for their sinful ways. And it's quite heartbreaking to think how many of the future bishops and priests of the church long before the Second Vatican Council were being told that this is just a story, it never happened. So Miss Acker, if you would come up and take over here, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. That was very powerful and essential for everyone to know these things, how the church has handled this in the past. I'd like to introduce Pamela Acker. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Southeast Missouri State University and a master's degree in biology from the Catholic University of America. In addition to her academic background, Pamela has spent several years doing laboratory research in public and private institutions. Her work includes creating geno genomic libraries for the Genome Sequence Center at Washington University in St. Louis, researching novel biotechnology applications 
for viral nanoparticles and investigating the developmental genetics of roundworms. For six or the last seven years, Pamela has taught high school science, including courses in biology, chemistry, and physics at Catholic schools in Virginia, Texas, and Kentucky. Pamela Acker. Got me all situated, and then I didn't have a clicker. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, the burden of proof um, that has been placed upon the evolutionary biologists to come up with some facts that would give us uh, sufficient reason to possibly rethink the doctrine of creation. And I'm going to point out to you that there is absolutely no intellectual foundation for that at all. And when you look at the things that are presented to you, when evolution is put forward as the truth, these things are often misleading, they're often misrepresented, and they do not show what they purport to show. And when you look at what they actually do show, they're actually remarkably in line with a literal interpretation of Genesis. So the science actually fits with and backs up what we believe as Catholics, as we expect it would, because truth doesn't contradict truth. So the title of my talk is Icons of Evolution, so I wanted to start with the idea of what an icon is. And here you see this beautiful icon of creation, and our Lord is there, and he's creating Adam. And you notice that the two of them are identical, because the first Adam was made in the image of the last Adam. There are animals there, it's beautiful, it's light, it's full of life. And we can think of this as a sermon without words. It's teaching us an inexpressible truth about the way that God created the world. <clears throat> and as we look at this icon over and over again, it's going to fill our souls with something about the nature of God. I take good mental note of this because I'm about to show you an icon of evolution. And it's depicting, supposedly, the same thing. So this is on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And this is evolution's idea of origins. So what we have here is a female gorilla skeleton. And she's holding something in her hand. She's handing it down to a female human skeleton. Of course, since they're skeletons, everything is dead. That which is lower is giving life to that which is higher, rather than that which is divine giving life to that which is man. And there's no light. It's all dark. And it should be fairly obvious to the average observer that this is a complete, utter, and blasphemous mockery of what we just saw. Everything is upside down and backwards. And when the devil tries to mess with something, that's what he does. He turns it upside down and backwards. And so we're going to look at um, six of the different evidences that are presented for evolution. And we're going to look at the pictures that are presented, and then we're going to talk about the science behind them. And you're going to see that none of these are going to require you to rethink your understanding of Genesis. And the first um, icon we'll talk about is this idea that natural selection is the same thing as molecules to man evolution. So usually you're presented with something that looks a little bit like this. On the left-hand side, you've got a herd of deer that's light and dark. And they migrate to a new area that's a lot colder. And there's some variation there in the population because they're both light and dark. The dark ones survive better in the cold weather because they absorb heat a little bit better. That's why they're all the um, dead light deer at the top. And if, you're, if your kids are in the school, um, you may have already had an earful about some of these things already, and, and they, were, they were quite shocked at all of the death that was involved here. Um, but this is an important point we're going to come back to. So the light deer die off, and the deer that are left reproduce, and the herd the next year looks a lot more like them. So we've seen change in a population over time. And anybody who's observed populations over time, or even if you've ever observed the birth of a child, you've seen a change in the genetic makeup in a population. This is something that is true, something that we observe in nature. But then the evolutionary biologist wants us to take this observable change in nature and say, okay, now that brown deer, he's going to lose his antlers and his legs, and he's going to grow flippers and a tail, and he's going to become a whale. And I don't know about you, but changing from light to dark doesn't seem extrapolatable from changing to a deer to a whale. So there are a couple of different um, uh, images that are presented under this heading of the idea that natural selection is the same thing as molecules to man evolution. 
So something we can observe is proof of something we can't observe that is absurd. Um, and one of those proofs is the peppered moths. And many of you have probably seen an image like this where you've seen some peppered moths that are perched on uh, light lichens that are growing on trees or perched on the dark bark of the trees. And you've been told something like, when the Industrial Revolution happened, the lichens started dying on the trees, and the trees were mostly dark. And so the population of moths shifted from a light color to a dark color over time. And so look, this is proof of evolution. Well, the first problem with this is that it's not becoming anything other than a moth. It's just a different colored moth. The second problem with this is that these moths are dead. They're penned in place because they don't naturally rest on tree trunks like that. And the scientists who did this experiment put them on tree trunks where they don't naturally rest and then watched the birds pick them off because they weren't camouflaged. That's not very good research methods. All right. And um, a third problem with this is that in some places in England, uh, they observed a shift in, to dark colored moths in areas that were polluted, but in some cases they observed a shift to light colored moths in areas that were polluted. In some cases they observed a shift to dark colored moths in areas that weren't polluted. And after the Industrial Revolution, Revolution, everything shifted back to light colored anyway, so did we really get any change there? And the fourth problem is the primary predator of these animals are bats, not birds. And if you know anything about the way bats eat, they don't use um, vision, they use echolocation. And sound waves bounce the same off of a light moth and a dark moth. So even if this was an example of natural selection, which it isn't a very good one, it still wouldn't be a very good example of evolution. Another example that's used is Darwin's finches. Um, Darwin is reported to have discovered something like 12 to 14 different species of finches um, when he went down to the Galapagos Islands. It turns out that actually laboratory experiments recently have demonstrated there are only about six species of finches because most of them can interbreed, but that's okay. There's still six. And um, a couple named Peter and Rosemary Grant went down to the Galapagos Islands, and they, they, they caught most of the birds on one specific island, and they measured their beaks. And the next year there was a drought, and they came back and measured their beaks again. And it turned out their beaks were about 5% larger, which amounts to about a millimeter. And they said, look, here's an evolutionary change. We're seeing these beaks change, and they're going to change into larger and larger beaks over time, or we're going to eventually have a new species of finch. Um, unfortunately for the grants, the next year it rained, and they came back, and the beak sizes had reduced back towards normal. So what we're seeing here, and even what we saw with the peppered moths, is not directional evolution that's eventually going to lead to the arising of a new species, and certainly not the arising of a new kind, because there's a distinction there between species and kind that we'll get to in a minute. Um, what we're seeing is oscillation around a mean. These animals have a normal, sort of stable intermediate, and when the environment changes, they have enough genetic flexibility to be able to adjust to it as a population. And when the environment goes back to normal, they go back to normal too. The second icon you're gonna see a lot of is missing links. In fact, there's a movie coming out, I think in a few days, or maybe it's already come out, I'm not very up on movies, um, that's called The Missing Link. And the most famous of these missing link icons is actually the one for whale evolution. This was unveiled by uh, Dr. Ken Miller, who claims to be a Catholic, at a trial in Kansas where they were debating allowing the teaching of non-evolutionary science in schools. And so someone challenged him with the idea that in the fossil record is very incomplete, there's, there's no transitional forms, and he unveiled something that looked like this drawing and said, look, we have these beautiful transitional forms in a very showman-like attitude. You can find it on YouTube. And so, according to Dr. Miller, this tiger on speed at the top of our chain here eventually became a slightly uh, more swimming-like animal and eventually grew a very long tail and some flippers and became a humpback whale. So we're gonna look at a couple of these missing links. Specifically, we're gonna look at the second one, the, the fourth one, and the fifth one. So a couple of the middle children here. Um, I showed this slide to a couple of classes yesterday, and I said, okay, guys, thumbs up if the top one is the right depiction of the Pachycetus, and thumbs down if the bottom one is the right one of the Pachycetus. Now, I can't really see your thumbs from here because of the stage lights, so I'm not going to ask you to do the same thing, but um, most of them were quite shocked when I said, um, ladies and gentlemen, they're both equally valid representations of Pachycetus because they look very, very different. So this brings us to one of our first problems with missing links, which is that when you, all you have is bones, 
it's very easy to model a creature on them that fits what you would like it to look like. So one author wanted it to be a little stockier, one author wanted it to be a little thinner and more lemur-like. Um, and they, they both have that prerogative. You could build either animal on the skeleton that we have. And so part of the problem is that this is the skeleton that we have. So in the top left corner, you see the most complete skeleton of Pachycetus that I could find that was actual bones. And you'll notice that half of it is missing. So you only have about one side of it, but that's okay. You can reconstruct the other side. But what you see in um, museums are images like the one at the bottom and the right, which is a reconstructed skeleton. And I pointed a couple of things out to the kids. The, the spiny ridges on the back there, there's only one of them in the actual skeleton, so the rest of them are hypothetical. We don't know if he had a ridge quite like that or not. And it's, a, it's an interesting, um, again, iconographic sleight of hand, if you will, to take something that's very incomplete and represent it as something that is whole. And one of the first occasions I had for doubting that evolution could possibly be true was wandering through a human evolution exhibit at a natural science museum. And I noted that there was a sort of color code at the beginning of the exhibit, and it, it said that the, the white parts of the skull were parts that had actually been discovered, and the brown parts of the skull were parts that had been reconstructed based on the parts that had been discovered. And a lot of these skulls were more brown than they were white, which to my understanding, meant they were more imaginary than real. And we see a better example of that with uh, our middle child here. He was right in the middle of the sequence. This is Rhodocetus. This is the most complete skeleton of Rhodocetus I could find. It had, we have the upper half of the skull. We have half of the pelvis, a few vertebrae, and a back leg. Yet note, in the artist's rendering, this animal's been given webbed feet and a tail. We know nothing about its feet or its tail, so this seems a little misleading to me. In fact, this drawing has actually been retracted by the original um, authors who put it out, and there was another drawing that was released where it had a fluked tail, which was even a little bit more misleading. And um, it, there's, there's a, a very sort of great desire here to fit what it is that we need to have a transitional form that's, that's motivating some of this artistic rendering. The last problem I'll talk about with whales is that in um, our sequence that supposedly has no missing links, the animal at the top, which was about 10 feet long, and it had its nostrils on the front of its nose, and its tail was a very small part of its body, and it had back legs, somehow gave birth to the 66-foot long animal that had a blowhole, a very long tail, and no back legs. And I don't want to know how that mama gave birth to that baby. That is a big baby. Okay, another problem with missing links is that sometimes we find them and they turn out to be very disappointing. And the coelacanth is a case in point of that. This was discovered in 1839 as a fossil. And originally evolutionists thought that those, those um, appendages down on the bottom were very fleshy and that they were somewhere between fins and legs. And they said, look, we found the transition between fish and land animals. And then in 1938, they caught a live coelacanth, and it turns out he just has fins. These are not transitional appendages. And uh, it turns out that their uh, claims might be slightly overrated up there. Archaeopteryx is also another commonly cited missing link, but according to one of the leading orth ornithologists in the world who has studied the fossils of this animal inside, outside, upside down, this is a bird. It's always been a bird. It's nothing but a bird. It is not transitional between dinosaurs and birds. It could fly. It had feathers that were very modern in construction. And even the things like claws on its wings that were originally thought to be reptilian, we see in actually very highly specialized birds like swans. So half of this timeline is true. The other half is not. I happen to like the last part of the timeline. Okay, so this brings me to an interesting point about transitional forms, which is that you could take any sequence of animals, find that they had similarities, arrange them in a way that put the more similar ones next to each other and the least similar ones farthest apart, and claim you had an evolutionary sequence. So clearly, the Chihuahua evolved into a Bernese mountain dog. That, or this graphic proves that I can sort things, and I might have some metaphysical assumptions. 
The third icon I'm going to talk about is dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are incredibly iconic. Um, children love them. And whenever you see a picture of dinosaurs, they're usually like this, or an exhibit in a museum. All you see, or the exhibit, is dinosaurs. And everything looks very prehistoric, right? But if we believe that God created man last, this picture seems a little misleading. There should be some other things there, along with the dinosaurs. And so, um, I'm actually going to get to that part in a moment. I'm going to start first with the um, soft tissue that's been discovered in dinosaur bones. So, dinosaurs are commonly believed to have gone extinct, I think, somewhere around 65 million years ago. Um, don't quote me on that number, but it's a, it's a big number in the millions. And when fossilized dinosaur bones are being studied, it's assumed that the only thing that's there is mineral and bone because nothing else could last that long. So in 2003, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, and I had a great video, but the sound didn't work yesterday, so I decided to just explain it to you. So you can look it up on YouTube, though. It was actually on 60 Minutes. So this is obviously not a, a creationist organization that's putting this information out there. But in 2003, she found some bone in a dinosaur that um, was medullary bone, and it was the first time this had ever been found in a dinosaur. And she took some of it and tried to dissolve it with acid. Um, just a little bit to get the outer layer off the surface of the bone so she could see something in the inner layer of the bone, but left the bone in acid too long, so the whole thing dissolved. There should have been nothing left. So why she looked at it, I don't know, but thanks be to God she did, because what she found when she looked at what was left of the bone was things that looked like the pictures that you're seeing there. In fact, I think these figures are actually pulled from some of her papers. Um, she found things that looked suspiciously like blood vessels that had things that looked suspiciously like red blood cells still in them. She found things that looked suspiciously like osteocytes, which are the bones that, um, or the cells that make up your bones and build your bones and take your bones apart. And they're all incredibly well preserved. And in the video, and again, I encourage you to look this up because it really is remarkable. Um, they take a, a sort of a pair of uh, microscopic tweezers and they grab the edge of a cell and they kind of pull it. And then she lets go of the tweezers and it snaps back. It's very elastic, very fresh, as if this thing didn't die that long ago. So a couple of challenges were raised to her experiments because, of course, this, this doesn't fit very well with the going paradigm that dinosaurs went extinct an incredibly long time ago. And the first hypothesis was that the tissue that she found, which, if you remember, looks like, like this, um, was a bacterial biofilm. Now, if you've studied cells and you've studied bacteria, you know that bacterial biofilms don't generally look like osteocytes, but that's okay. They had to raise some objection. So Dr. Schweitzer herself tested the material that she found for collagen, because collagen is a protein that's only present in vertebrates, not present in bacteria. So if collagen was found in these samples, that would mean they're definitely not of bacterial origin. It turns out collagen was found in these samples. So they're definitely of vertebrate origin. A second objection was raised that the, the tissue was somehow completely sheltered from oxygen and microbes, and so that's how it was sort of preserved for so long, for 67 million years. This wasn't necessarily an objection, but it was a hypothesis about how it could have been preserved so long. But um, several of the samples that they collected in Hell Creek, Montana, were actually exposed to the surface, and they were even submerged in water. And if you know anything about water and rock, water can um, introduce things into rock and leach things out of rock. So this is definitely not a closed environment where there would have been no oxygen or microbes. So this tissue should have decomposed a long time ago. And the third objection um, or hypothesis that was raised to account for this is that um, somehow iron from the lysed blood cells preserved this tissue for a really long time. And so Dr. Schweitzer, again, tested this, but there were a couple problems with her methods, one of which is that you could replicate the same thing, the same results she, she got using dye instead of iron, which um, gives one the indication that it, this is perhaps a, a qualitative experiment that is, is not particularly well uh, documented. And then the other thing is that she only carried out her experiments for two years and then wanted to extrapolate that for 67 million. Now, if I did that, I, I wouldn't get to keep my title of being a scientist. And then the other problem with this is that uh, uh, there's been other soft tissue discoveries in things like beardworm sponges and even dinosaur skin, which are areas that are pretty bloodless, and so that tissue couldn't have been preserved by this method. So um, really, the laws of chemistry and physics tell us that 
if these bones are 67 million years old, that tissue should have decomposed a long time ago. In fact, the best biochemists out there estimate at the very most possible maximum this stuff could have survived for 100,000 years. So given those two premises, that the laws of soft tissue tell, or laws of science tell us soft tissue can only survive thousands, I'm sorry, did I say 100 million? I meant 100,000. Um, thousands, not millions of years. And then we have T-Rex fossils with soft tissue. We're left with two conclusions. Either the T-Rex must have lived thousands, not millions of years ago, or the laws of science are wrong. I'm going to go with A. And now I'm back to modern animals with dinosaurs. So there's a lot of really good biochemical evidence that dinosaurs lived not that long ago. There's a lot of really good archaeological evidence that dinosaurs lived not that long ago. And there's a lot of evidence that stuff that lived with dinosaurs hasn't changed much, which might also indicate that dinosaurs lived not that long ago. So these are a couple quotations from evolutionary biologists just pointing out, out that there are a number of modern organisms that are actually found fossilized with dinosaurs. And this one's my favorite. Um, this is a paleontologist admitting that they find mammals at almost all of the sites where they dig for dinosaurs. So they're finding mammals in the same strata, they're finding dinosaurs. Have you ever seen a mammal depicted with a dinosaur? Yeah, neither have I. They have about 20,000 pounds of bentonite clay that's full of mammal fossils that were found with dinosaur fossils, and nobody wants to touch this. Because, you know, well, I've only got one life to live, and I decided to study dinosaurs. Dude, you could revolutionize science. But they don't want to. All right, fourth icon is the tree of life. I put that in quotes because Hugh cringes every time I say it. He calls it the tree of death, as you heard last night. Um, because it took a lot of death to get from the supposed ancestor down there in the center uh, in, on part of the black lines all the way over to, you're, you're over here, way over here on the right at the end, sort of appearing in the 11th hour in the 11th evolutionary time scale, which is another way to make you feel insignificant. And there's some interesting things that go into arranging these trees of life. So we started out arranging trees of life um, based on fossils. And I, I, <laughs> I love this diagram. It comes from a um, 1997 textbook. And notice the caption under the, the little phylogeny tree that's every, where everything's all connected beautifully. It says, the real pattern of evolution. And then the next one shows a fairly complete network, which is what we see sort of with the whales, except that we just saw that they're not really all that nicely related. And then the C is the incomplete fossil record. The evidence of gradual change is lost. So this diagram by itself and the way it's presented, again, we go back to this icon. It's, it's trying to get you to believe this idea that the, the evolutionary change is there. We just can't see it. So the fact that we're not finding evidence for it just means we've lost the evidence. It doesn't mean that it's not true. So we started out building trees based on um, things called homologies. Now homologies are defined as structural or behavioral similarities that are observed between two different organisms that arise from a shared common ancestor. So in order to be a homology, you have to have had a common ancestor. Yet common ancestry is often inferred from things that appear to be homologies. So if you remember our circular definition from last night, the fossils date the rocks and the rocks date the fossils, well, the homology proves evolution, but it can only be a homology if it evolved. Are you noticing a pattern? Okay, so children are often shown a diagram like this with everything beautifully color-coded to say all these bones are homologous. They arose from a common ancestor, and the reason that a human has bone structures in its limbs that are somewhat similar to a cat and a whale and a bat is because, you know, we all evolved from a common mammal ancestor. Um, but there's a problem with that, and that problem is so ubiquitous it has a name. It's called convergent evolution. And this is when you have things that aren't particularly well related, yet they have very similar structural features. So these things are called analogies because they're not homologies. But by looking at an organism, how do you tell if it's an analogy or a homology? You kind of have to assume that they have a close evolutionary relationship. So evolutionary biologists had to start looking for some better evidence. And uh, Mr. Owen went over the embryos quite a bit, so I'll, I'll just sort of mention here that, that embryology was thought to um, also show some homology, show that we came from a common ancestor. And uh, I like this image very much because it, it shows you that 
Heckel should have failed art school. Um, but also because when I, when I put this image up and I'm speaking to a group of students, I point out to them that, that Heckel identified this as sort of the earliest stage of the embryo. Now, granted, micro microscopes weren't in tremendous use when he was doing this research, but this is not the earliest stage of the embryo. And if you've studied embryology at all or biology at all, you know that you started out as a single cell. Now, you would think that a single cell couldn't divide in that many different ways, but it turns out that single cells divide in a lot of different ways, and a lot of different organisms divide. They'll divide across different planes, so they'll divide um, front to back, or they'll divide top to bottom, and sometimes they'll divide symmetrically, and sometimes they'll divide asymmetrically, and so from the very first cell division, we're different. In fact, sometimes organisms are more different at that cell division than they are at this stage. So he picked a stage where we looked as close as possible, and then he faked the drawing so they looked a little more close. So that doesn't really help us draw phylogenetic trees either. So we turn to genetics. And unfortunately, the top of this title is cut off, so I'll tell it to you. You share half your genes with a banana and other interesting genetic anomalies. <clears throat> so when we look at genetics, we find out that humans and plants share the same hemoglobins, so our hemoglobins are very similar. So that means that we must have had a close common ancestor with plants. Okay, it gets weirder. Um, uh, in 88 proteins that were studied, um, the scientists decided that rabbits are primates, not rodents, so they're more like monkeys than rats. 13 genes in 14 different species of animals showed us that sea urchins are actually closer more closely related to vertebrates than they are to invertebrates, even though they don't have backbones. Twelve protein uh, sequences showed us that cows are related to whales, and not other hoofed animals. So I wasn't kidding about losing your, your antlers and legs and becoming a whale. <clears throat> um, a study of a single-chain antigen receptor protein finds that sharks are closely related to camels. And my favorite is that bats and dolphins have a sonar system that's almost identical at a molecular level. So if we're positing an evolutionary common origin and everything came from the same ancestor, clearly they're very closely related. And all of this, of course, proves that bunnies come from tomato plants. It's right there. You see the bunny, right? Okay. Um, what this really shows is something quite different. And I won't harp too much on this. I usually harp on it a lot because it's, it's um, inconceivable to me that so many biologists preach about this, but then they miss it when it comes to evolution. So I'm showing you pictures of two things you've probably never seen before in your life. Yet, if I picked any one of you out of the audience, you could probably give me one word description of what these two things are. Thank you. They're chairs. How did you know that? You've never seen them before. You know that because they have a seat and they have a back and they look like they were designed for a human to sit in them. Okay? Bats and dolphins both use echolocation, which is almost identical at a molecular level because in order to do echolocation, you need the correct proteins and the correct tissues and they have to function in the correct way and they won't function that way if they don't have the same shape. Shocker. So structure has more to do, structural similarity has more to do with functional use, not with common ancestry. There's a completely non-evolutionary explanation for all of these things that we see, similarities in genes, similarities in physical structures, and even similarities that are potentially observable in embryonic development. <clears throat> the fifth icon I'll talk about is, uh, you may have seen this on a t-shirt, that you're 98% chimp. You're not. Um, the actual estimates that were initially given in the early 2000s when the chimp genome was first sequenced is that we're actually 3.9 to 13 percent different from chimps. And so to put this in perspective for you, at a 3.9 percent difference, that's 117 million base pairs, which would be about 29,250 pages to record all of these differences. And that's an estimated 390 to 1,300 mutations per generation. Now, if you're mutating at that rate, and of course that all has to be in the germline, so it, ha it can't just be sort of all over your body, it has to be specifically in the gametes, otherwise it won't be passed on. If you're mutating at that rate, um, you're probably dying, and 
the current research suggests that only about 100 mutations happen per generation in chimps and humans, and that only accounts for about half the differences we see between them at the lowest level of similarity. But it turns out that it, we're not even that similar. Because when you sequence, I'm sorry this has no captions, but it was the best uh, picture I could find to illustrate how genomes are sequenced. And I used to do this for a living. Um, I did the part where I took the whole genome, that's the bar at the top, and I cut it into the tiny little bits that are all mixed up <laughs> in the second row. Um, and then somebody else took all those tiny little bits that are all mixed up and they said, well, this one kind of overlaps with that one. So we, we think those two sequences go together and the one comes before the other. And well, this one kind of overlaps with that one. It's a very painstaking process to, to sort of find all the overlaps and reconstruct everything back together. And then you get something like what you have at the bottom, which still has some gaps. In fact, it turns out that in November, somebody published some data that the Human Genome Project was missing uh, 500 million base pairs. So originally, humans were thought to have 3 billion base pairs. Now we know that they have 3.5 billion base pairs. We just we missed a little data there, just a little first time we did this. Um, because it's a very painstaking, tedious process. There's a lot of repetitive DNA in the genome. So, you know, it does kind of make sense. So. All of this was done to sequence the human genome, and you might think that, you know, science being supposedly objective and legitimate, that they would do the, sa the same method to sequence the chimp genome, but they didn't. They took the already sequenced human genome with its gaps, and they lined up the chimp pieces along the already sequenced human genome. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like science to me because you assume that we're related, so you assume that our sequences are the same, so you line them up together and you say, oh look, it's only 2% different. Shocker. That makes me so mad. <laughs> um, so, scientists have recognized that that was a really crummy way to sequence the chimp genome, so they resequenced it, and it turns out that initial estimates give us at a 17% difference and so that doesn't sound as remarkable maybe as we would like it to, but remember, you're 50% similar to a banana. <laughs> so 87 per, or 83% similar to a chimp, is, it's really not that close. Um, but no discussion of human evolution would be quite complete without a little bit of discussion of fossils. So I have some fossils here. And if, if you're a child in the audience and you're going to see this slide tomorrow, you're not allowed to answer this question because you already know the answer. Um, but I want you to pick out the human skull, and I want you to pick out the Homo erectus skull from this lineup. Think you got it? Maybe there's a monkey in there too. Okay. Or maybe they're all Homo erectus skulls. Now you thought for a little while about which one was human. I, re I set you up. I'm so sorry. Um, but you thought for a while about which one looked really human, right? And which one maybe looked like mm, not quite human and which one maybe looked like this, this one over here looks a little almost ape-like. Okay, these are all Homo erectus skulls. And I use this image because it's a very powerful, again, icon. It's a very powerful image that shows you that there's a tremendous amount of variation within species, especially when it comes to skull structure. And it turns out that no matter what bones we look at with, Homo erectus, who's the supposed human ancestor, or intermediate link in between apes and man, um, the bones fall within the normal range of modern human variation. Now, if you buried Shaquille O'Neal and Danny DeVito next to one another, and somebody dug them up a thousand years later, they might think they were different species. But they're both human, and they're both showing extremes in that variation. So. Most of the Homo erectus fossils that have been identified are explicable via perfectly natural processes. And they're all within normal ranges of humans, such that evolutionary biologists are actually calling for the sinking of Homo erectus as a species and saying, this isn't a species, it's actually Homo sapiens, and we're just misclassifying things because we're finding them in old rocks and we think they can't be human. So the last icon I'm going to talk to, this is always the, the good part, right? In conclusion. Um, the last icon I'm going to talk to you about today is mutations. So mutations are a huge part of evolutionary theory from a bi biological perspective because to have evolution, 
go back to that very first slide, the very first icon with the deer, the dark ones and the light ones, you have to have variation in a population. And there's a lot of ways that variation can arise, but the only way that new variations can arise is through mutation, because everything else just shuffles genetic information that's already there. So to go from a microbe to a man, you have to have lots of new stuff, because we're a little more complicated than a microbe. Um, so if mutations are the only way to get lots of new stuff, they have to be the key mechanism of evolution. So um, quick primer in biology. <laughs> um, we can think of DNA as a set of instructions for building an organism. And we can, when I talk about being made of bases, it's, uh, we can think these are, of these as being analogous to letters in the instructions. And these letters are arranged into sentences or, and, or paragraphs, which we can call genes. And the whole set of information that's needed to build the organism could be called the genome. So the DNA is a set of instructions. Nucleotides are the letters. Genes are the paragraphs. The genome is the whole thing. So far, so good? Um, so a little bit of analogy here for how genetic information is passed on. Now, Imagine our instruction manual for building a giraffe contains thousands of pages of genetic information. Having the light giraffe. Um, in order to survive, to build all the things interiorly that he needs, to breathe, to eat, et cetera, et cetera, the giraffe must have his own instruction manual or he can't function. But the giraffes haven't invented the printing press yet. So each giraffe must painstakingly copy the instructions of his parents. Who copied it from their parents? Who copied it from their parents? Who copied it from their parents? Now, this is kind of a silly analogy, but it actually works for DNA, because you got your DNA from your parents, and it was copied by an enzyme called DNA polymerase, and your children got their DNA from you. And if you're, you're not passing, and many of you are not passing on your DNA in this audience, so you're, you're losing the evolutionary game. I mean, the population's not gonna look like you in the next generation, sorry. <coughs> it's not gonna look like me either. <laughs> um, so mutations, we can think of more or less as a copying error in the set of instructions that codes for a living organism. So um, that changes our instructions. So it might change just one letter or just one nucleotide, or it might change a gene, or it might change a whole set of genes. But either way, it's, it's, a, it's a copying error in that set of instructions. So in order for mutations to be the mechanism of evolution, in order for them to be the way that evolution happens, most of our instruction manual should be useless. Because if we're going around changing useful information in the instruction manual, usually it's gonna result in death. So a lot of mutations are what's called embryonic lethal. That means that the baby can't survive. And that's pretty, can't even survive long enough to be born. So that's pretty bad. Um, so in order to accumulate a lot of mutations over millions and millions and millions of years, most of that instruction manual has to be useless. So it won't matter if we change it a little bit. Most of the changes should be basically harmless or neutral. So if we have really, really bad changes, I just told you, it usually results in death. So most of the changes have to be neutral in order for evolution to work through mutation. Some of the changes have to be good. They have to give us a benefit. And the accumulation of all those changes together has to lead to the development of new animals. So we're going to look at why each of those four points is not true. And I apologize, this is the most complicated part of what I'm talking about in this icon. So the first problem with our, our scenario here is that um, according to ENCODE, who were the scientists who took over the human, studying the human genome after the Human Genome Project finished, um, they have, as of 2012, assigned at least 80% of the human genome some meaningful function. And there's very good reason to believe that as we continue to study the he human genome, most of it will be functional. And I could go into tremendous detail about the work I did in Dr. Ann Corsi's lab at the Catholic University of America studying the genetics of roundworms and explain to you how things that we thought were useless we actually found to be very important to be involved in the worm being able to properly um, survive. And that's just one example. And pseudogenes have been found to have functions and introns have been found to have functions and all these things that we thought were functionless have been found to have functions, but that all gets incredibly complicated, so ask me about it later. Um, but all of that is involved in regulation. So you're different from a banana, not because your genes are that different. You still have to use oxygen. You still have to break down glucose. You still have to survive in a, um, an environment where there are free radicals. You have lots of similar proteins. But the way those proteins are expressed and the way that they're turned on and off in your cells is totally different. And that's why you are totally different from a banana. So all that regulatory stuff 
is the most important part of your genome. And that's what scientists have been calling junk DNA for years. And we're finding, starting to find out that more and more and more and more of it has a function. So our instruction manual is actually mostly or completely useful. So now if we get any changes in it, we have a problem. Our second problem is that mutations aren't really harmless. And I'm going to show you this with a very simple analogy. If I texted this to you, you would probably text me something back like all the time if you were plugged into teenage culture in the 90s. Um, if I texted you this, you would say, oh, she hits the send button too fast. All these typos. But you would still understand what I meant. But if I texted you this, this no longer has the same meaning as the original sentence. Now you think I'm telling you I understood it, but I'm using very poor grammar. So this is a very short sequence with only two changes. And a very short sequence with only two changes, I'm completely altered the meaning of this information. But either of these two alterations by themselves wouldn't have been that important. So Dr. John Sanford, who was the inventor of the gene gun and author of the book Genetic Entropy, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, has pointed out that when you have a mutation that is seemingly neutral by itself, when you put that in interaction with all the other mutations in the genome and all the other information in the genome, it can't possibly be neutral. It's either slightly good or slightly bad. And there's a graph I usually show at this point that I left out because it makes most people twitch. Um, this is kind of confusing. But the important information that's on that graph, and it was published by an evolutionary biologist who came up with this idea of, of neutral theory, is that it shows a very interesting line on the side of mutations that are negative, and it shows nothing on the side of mutations that are beneficial. So negative mutations outweigh beneficial mutations so much so that the beneficial mutations don't even show up on the graph. And most of those mutations fall within what he calls a no-selection zone. So he called them neutral because natural selection can't work on them, but they're actually slightly negative. And so if you accumulate a lot of these slightly negative mutations, that starts to become a problem, especially if everything in the genome is useful. Third problem, are there really good mutations? When you think of mutations, you probably think of things like cancer or diabetes. And the, the little girl there in, in pink, surrounded by all the equipment that takes to take, keep her alive for a month, is actually my niece, um, who was diagnosed with diabetes about a year ago. And if you asked her whether mutations are good or not, I'm sure she would tell you they're not. She doesn't like having four shots a day. So how could these same things that lead to changes that cause death and, and ill health for life be good? Well, often evolutionary biologists will point to antibiotic resistance as, a, as an icon of good mutation. So the antibiotic no longer works in the bacteria. That's very good for the bacteria, very bad for you. Um, and they say, this is, a, this is a beneficial mutation. But this beneficial mutation comes with a cost, because the same thing that makes the bacterium immune to the antibiotic actually weakens the bacteria in another way. And in this specific instance with the, with the MRSA, the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, it's an, alter, an, an alteration in the cross-linking in the peptidoglycan layer, which is the outer layer of the bacteria that protects it from its environment. And that alteration in the cross-linking also causes that protection to break down a little bit. It's not as strong as in the non-mutated bacteria. So if you put MRSA in with non-mutated um, staph, yeah, staph aureus, then the, the non-mutated bacteria outcompetes the mutated one every time. It's far more fit in an environment where there aren't antibiotics. So what we're seeing here is really not, not a positive gain. It's, it's almost like a, a zero-sum gain, where if you gain a benefit in one circumstance, you're actually losing a benefit in another circumstance because you've damaged the information that was there to make the thing that you already had that you kind of actually need to survive. And the fourth problem is that as mutations accumulate, bacteria are still bacteria, fruit flies are still fruit flies, finches are still finches, and peppered moths are still peppered moths. We're not seeing a change of one kind of organism to another kind of organism. We might in some cases see what's called speciation, where a group of finches loses the ability to interbreed with another group of finches, but we don't see finches giving rise to cats, or tigers and speed giving rise to whales. It just doesn't happen. So the last problem that I'll talk about is genetic entropy, and that's the problem with this mutation. So if I'm copying this instruction manual over and over and over, and I'm making errors every generation, 
So you made some errors, and your parents made some errors, and your grandparents made some errors. So your grandparents actually had fewer errors than you. And they gave all the error, errors that they had accumulated from their ancestors to your parents, and they added some more errors. And they gave all those errors to you, and you added some more errors, and then you gave them to your kids, and they're going to add some more errors, and they're going to give them to their kids. So what's gradually happening over time? Are you building up genetic information and becoming Superman? Or are you accumulating negative even slightly negative mutations, and quote unquote devolving. <clears throat> so if we know, and we do, that virtually all of the genome is functional, so this idea of junk DNA or useless DNA is falsified, we know that there is no truly neutral mutation because if everything is important, then changing any of it causes an effect, and that mutations that are beneficial actually come with a cost and that no matter how many mutations an organism accumulates, it still doesn't become another kind of organism, even though it might become another species of that same kind of organism, we're left with this problem, that the genome is actually degenerating, and we're headed towards not supermanhood, but error catastrophe. So the point at which we've accumulated so many mutations that we're actually going to go extinct because we can't survive anymore. Not to, you know, leave you on a sad note or anything. <laughs> Um, but Dr. Sanford sums it up this way. He says, the genome is actually degenerating. It's bad news for the long-term future of the human race. It's also bad for evolutionary theory. If, natural, if mutation and selection cannot preserve the information already within the genome, it's difficult to imagine how it could have created all that information in the first place. You cannot rationally speak of genome building when there's a net loss of information every generation any more than you can rationally speak of building a fortune when you're losing five cents on every transaction. So mutations fail as a viable mechanism of evolution. And normally I would take questions at this point, but instead I'll just leave you with this joke and we'll do questions at the end because I believe Mr. Owen has a few more words he wants to say. Well, you've been very patient again, and I will try to make this very, very short, but I want to try to wrap things up so that you have hopefully uh, a clear idea of what is at stake in this matter. Uh, we often, I'm sorry, I'm here without the slide advancer, so if I could just ask you to advance the slide for me, or, or else I don't know where the gadget is, but I could, it's on the table behind me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. But, it's amazing how many times over the years we've been asked, well, what difference does it make whether I believe that God created everything as Moses tells us in Genesis or used billions of years of evolutionary processes as long as I believe that God did it? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas answered that question a long time ago in the Summa Contra Gentilis. He says that the opinion of those who say that it doesn't matter what we believe about creation, about how God created the world, as long as we have a true opinion of God, he says that is notoriously false because an error about creation is always reflected in a false opinion of God. In other words, the character of God is at stake. And this is why St. Thomas goes on to quote the psalmist who says that because they did not understand the works of the Lord and the operations of his hands. In other words, how he created the world, they were destroyed. Because what we believe about creation is the foundation of our faith. If that's wrong, our foundation will not stand. And this is why St. Paul in the letter to the Romans says, the wrath of God is poured out upon anyone who denies the truth about creation. And he says, the invisible things of God are clearly revealed in the things that he has made. It's interesting, in Vatican I, this passage is quoted in the context of defining that it is possible to know that God, the creator, exists just from studying creation without any revelation from God. And in that context, the council fathers were teaching that humans have been there from the beginning of creation because St. Paul says, from the beginning of creation, 
the invisible things of God are clearly revealed and have been clearly revealed in the things that he has made. So it's implicit in the Vatican I statement that humans have existed from the very beginning of creation as the Pontifical Biblical Commission reaffirmed and as the church has always taught from the beginning. Now, Charles Darwin, around 1861, wrote a letter to another naturalist, Asa Gray, in which he said that every time he looked at the fantail of a peacock, it made him sick. And this is a strange thing for a naturalist, someone who loves nature, to say, but it's very revealing because what it shows is that even Charles Darwin could not get himself to believe that this artistic masterpiece was the result of a struggle for existence and slow random changes over hundreds of thousands of years. And yet, we pay people good money in most of our Catholic schools and universities all over the world to tell children that this artistic masterpiece happened this way. Once upon a time, there was a peacock who had a few feathers and he had one or two mutations and as a result, his feathers were a little bit more numerous or a little bit more colorful than the average peacock. And so the peahens fell head over heels in love with him and a few hundred thousand years later, we ended up with this artistic masterpiece. Well, the reality is that real scientists who have studied real peacocks and real peahens in the real world have found that peahens do not prefer the peacocks who have the aesthetically more pleasing fantails. Yes, the fantail does have a function. It does play a part in the courting ritual. But when you look at what is involved at the level of genetics to produce this artistic masterpiece, the idea that it would be cobbled together one or two mutations at a time <laughs> over hundreds of thousands of years is absolutely ludicrous. But that begs the question then, why does the peacock have an artistic masterpiece on his shoulders? Because you see, we for decades have been paying people to make it impossible for our own children and grandchildren to answer that question correctly. Because the only answer to that question is because God loves you. That is the only reason why the peacock has this excessively beautiful artistic masterpiece on his shoulders. And that's the only reason why God has filled this world with things that are much more beautiful than they need to be. Because God loves us. And yet, by accepting this evolutionary mythology and teaching it in our schools and universities now for 50, 60, 70 years, we have actually destroyed the ability of our own children to look at what God created and to understand what it's really saying to them. We have, as St. Paul says, exchanged the truth for a lie. And here he says something very interesting. He says, when you suppress the truth about creation, God will allow you to do it, but then you will begin to act against your own nature. And he says, men will start going with men and women with women and acting against their God-given nature. Exactly what we see. Now, I want to just, I'm almost done, but I want to just take two or three minutes to have us reflect on what would happen in our own Catholic community if we believed and taught just this one part of the true Catholic doctrine of creation that was handed down to us from the apostles, that Eve was literally created from Adam's side. Well, first of all, we would be continually reminded that God created Adam first. God created Adam first, according to the fathers and doctors, because God created man to be the spiritual head of his wife, and in this case, of the whole human family. God created man 
to have spiritual authority and leadership over his wife and the human family. This is why the commandment not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not given to Eve directly. It was given to Adam. And Eve had to learn the word of God through her husband who was in the role of a priest to her. And the fathers say that if Eve had sinned and Adam had corrected her, the fall would never have taken place because Eve was completely under the authority of her husband according to God's design. Now this is related to another very important truth. Nowadays we have many cardinals, we have many bishops around the world saying that we should be looking at the possibility of deaconesses and maybe even women priests. And the usual response from faithful Catholics is to say, no, that's impossible. Pope St. John Paul II reminded us that our Lord Jesus Christ only chose men to be his apostles and disciples. Well, that argument carries no weight whatsoever with these people because their response will be, of course, in that stage of evolution, in that cultural context, it was a patriarchal society, of course, our Lord adapted himself to that stage of evolution, to that cultural context, but we're in a new situation. We've evolved into a new context, and it would be absurd for us to feel constrained to abide by the cultural norms that prevailed in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. So how do we give at least a coherent response. We can't unless we go back to the sacred history of Genesis. Because what we can then say, even if we're dealing with a modernist who's convinced that Genesis is a fairy tale, at least we give him a coherent response, which is that God created the man to be the priest from the beginning. That's the way it's written into the very way that he created the first man and the first woman. That's a coherent response. And that's a response that makes sense to young people when it's explained to them in this way. One last point, and there's so many other beautiful truths that we can draw just from this one part of the true Catholic doctrine of creation. I'm just going to mention one more because God has given my wife and me nine living children. We have four who are married. We have 16 grandchildren. We have two who are religious sisters in a Benedictine Abbey. We have three boys who haven't yet discerned their vocation. But one of the things that we've noticed as our children have grown up is how painful it is nowadays to be a young adult, especially if you discern the call to matrimony, but even if you discern a call, let's say, to religious life. You wonder, how am I going to find a man or a, or a woman that believes as I do so that I could have a true Catholic family? And so we have an explosion of dating services now, Catholic dating services, where I can put in my information and hope that somebody somewhere is going to match up with me and will be able to live happily ever after. And I know that there have been some happy endings but there have also been a lot of disaster stories. And I believe that if we taught this, if we believed and taught this to our young people, we would shut down all of the Catholic dating services immediately. And here's why. Because when God created Adam and Eve, he created them perfect in their genetics, perfect in body and in mind, but also in an exalted state of holiness, not primitive so that from the moment of their creation until they succumbed to the temptation of Satan, all they wanted to do was to love God, adore God, live one life with God in every thought, every word, every action. That is normal human life. And so Adam being in that state where all he wanted to do was love and adore God with his whole being in every moment of his life, it was the simplest thing in the world for God to put him into a sleep or some say an ecstasy and he formed from his very own body the perfect spouse for him. Adam didn't have to go courting. He didn't have to do anything because all he wanted to do at that time was the perfect will of God and so God was free to do everything that he needed to do 
to provide Adam with that perfect spouse that he created for him. So what's the lesson for us and for our young people? If we're concerned about finding the right spouse, spouse or even the right religious community or, or congregation or seminary or whatever it may be, all we have to do is follow the example of Adam in the beginning. Just concentrate on doing the perfect will of God in each moment of the day. And we are certain that God will then do whatever is necessary to connect us with the right spouse or the right religious community or the right seminary or whatever the case may be. And here's the proof. Zeli and Louis, Saint Zeli and Saint Louis Martin, the parents of the little flower, Saint Therese of Lisieux. You probably know, Louis wanted to be a monk. Zeli wanted to be a nun. Louis went to a monastery to try his vocation. He didn't know enough Latin, so they had to send him home. Zeli had health problems, so they had to send her home. So they went back to their hometown of Lisieux, and they immediately joined a Catholic dating service. No, of course not. There were no Catholic dating services. We know what happened because Zeli told us that they were passing each other on a bridge and our Lord Jesus Christ said to Zeli in her heart, this is he whom I have prepared for you. They didn't have to join a Catholic dating service because all they wanted to do was the perfect will of God in every moment. And so God brought them together and very soon thereafter they were introduced and they married and from their union came the greatest saint of modern times and of the whole beautiful family. So what's really the bottom line in everything that we've presented over the last two days? It is that the character of the true God is a character of life, of love, and of truth. But the character of this God, little g, of evolution tells us that he is a God of death, destruction, and deception. And I don't know how the Almighty could have made it any clearer than he did in the Book of Wisdom, where he says, God made not death, neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living, for he made all things to be. Because what we, are, what we have been teaching most of our children for 50, 60 years now, and it really goes back long before then that we were teaching this to the future bishops and priests in seminaries throughout the Western world, we're telling them that it's death that brings forth human life. Or if you like Carl Sagan's turn of phrase, only through an immense number of deaths of slightly maladapted organisms are you and I, brains and all, here today. So the God of evolution, which is the God that is being presented to Catholic students all over the world as the true God, needed hundreds of millions of years of death and destruction to bring the bodies of the first human beings into existence. It's totally diabolical. And the book of the prophet Amos tells us that God does not do anything without telling his servants the prophets. So the queen of prophets not only warned us about the errors of Russia in 1917, she came back to Blessed Elena Aiello fairly recently, around 1960. She said, the people of this time are worse than the people at the time of Noah's flood. How bad is that? We go back to Genesis and Moses tells us that before the flood God saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times. That's pretty bad. Well she didn't just tell us this once. On the anniversary of the miracle of the sun, 1973, the year of Roe versus Wade, from a statue that wept human tears 101 times and shed human blood. 
She gave a message that was taken by the local ordinary Bishop Ito to then Cardinal Ratzinger so that he could get the Cardinal's blessing to publish the message. And Cardinal Ratzinger said, yes, publish it. It's the continuation of the message of Fatima. And in this message, she says that if mankind does not repent, the Heavenly Father will send a punishment worse than the flood. Fire will fall from heaven, killing most of the people on earth. And what did they see on October 13? They saw the fire from heaven coming down, only it was a warning. It wasn't the real thing. Well, the good news is that we have the absolute promise of the Queen of Heaven that in the end her Immaculate Heart will triumph, that the Holy Father will consecrate Russia by name, which has never happened, that Russia will convert, and that a period of peace will be granted to the world. But in that era of peace, there's not going to be any more theistic evolution. When that, the greatest evangelization in the history of Christianity takes place, it's going to be on the foundation of the true Catholic doctrine of creation. But she says that first, her immaculate heart has to triumph, and that's an interior triumph. So the most important thing that we need to understand is that we need to live our consecration to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary in every thought, in every word, in every action, insofar as the grace of God will help us to do it. Because when enough of us are doing that, that's what will bring down the grace for the Holy Father to consecrate Russia by name, for Russia to be converted, and then for the year of peace to be ushered in. But in the meantime, I hope that you will make your own investigation of what has been presented tonight and last night. And if you conclude that what we are defending here is the truth, is the true Catholic doctrine of creation, the foundation of our faith, that you will get into the fight. Because the young people are leaving the church in droves because of this theistic evolution teaching. And we've been all over the world and we've seen that when young people are given the truth, as your children who attend this wonderful school have been able to do over the last couple of days, they are much less likely to lose their faith than the rest of their peers. And in fact, if they really receive this teaching and it's, it sticks, they won't lose the faith because their foundation is sure. So the time has come, as Joshua said, for us to choose. This process of self-destruction has been going on long enough. It's time for us to stop and choose this day whom we are going to serve, the God of creation, the true God, or this God little g of evolution. The true God of creation is the one who spoke and it was made, who commanded and it was created, who created out of love, supernaturally, a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe for us in our first parents in view of the Immaculate Conception and the Incarnation, a world that was completely free from human death, deformity, disease, man harming natural disasters, or any of these kinds of disorders. And there was only the original sin that brought this misery into the world. And our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, took that misery upon himself, founded the Holy Church, and invited us to become cooperators with him by his grace in restoring everything back to the beauty that it had in the beginning and to bring it to its final perfection. Who wouldn't fall in love with a God like that? Or are we going to allow our children and grandchildren to have their faith 
once and for all completely extinguished by allowing yet another generation to be initiated into this false belief in the false idol of evolution, who uses hundreds of millions of years of death and destruction, mutation, deformity, disease, extinctions. And after this orgy of violence, he finally gets around to evolving the body of the first human being from some subhuman primates, puts in a soul, and then places these first human beings into a world that he himself, the demonic god little g of evolution, has filled with death, deformity, disease, and destruction. And then he allows his church to teach a totally false account of the origins of man in the universe from the very beginning. And then instead of raising up Catholic saints and scholars from within his church to enlighten us about how he actually brought everything into existence, he raises up godless men like Charles Lyell and T.H. Huxley who hate the church and want to destroy her and uses them to enlighten his own church leaders so they can finally understand how he brought everything into existence. Young people are not stupid. We have been teaching this nonsense for 50, 60, 70 years. And they, whether they can articulate it or not, they understand very well. Number one, the Holy Catholic Church is not an infallible teacher. She taught something at a very high level of authority about the fundamental doctrine of creation that was completely wrong from the very beginning. Secondly, they understand the Holy Scriptures are not inerrant. They contain myths. They contain things that are factually incorrect. And number three, the teaching authority of the church is not trustworthy because the people who had to enlighten the church leadership were the godless scientists. So who are the ones that really have the answers? It's the godless scientists. And we wonder why we have a mass exodus of most of our young people out of the church. Until we eradicate totally this evolution heresy, we are not going to put an end to modernism. We are not going to put an end to the crisis of faith and morals. So let us pray that through the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, our Lord will grant us the grace to live our consecration in every moment so that we will be able to obtain the grace to return to the true doctrine of creation that is the foundation of our holy Catholic faith. And I invite you to end by saying with me the words of this beautiful psalm. For thou hast formed me in my mother's womb. Thou hast laid thy hand upon me.